All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Happy Easter, everybody. And um, the sermon's not about this at all, but Easter itself, that word, is not a bad word. It's not a pagan word. It's a Bible word. It's used one time in the Bible, and it's referring, essentially it's referring to the Passover time, but it's after Christ has already come and risen again from the dead, and it's the, the, the reference to what we celebrate in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, I don't want to get into that really at all this morning, but... Um, what I do want to get started off into here is the importance of the resurrection. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical. It's extremely important. I mean, pretty much our salvation, everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there's lots of things that are very important to understand and then had to happen for our salvation. And I don't want to downplay any of those, but the resurrection is extremely important. That's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. Now, at this time, um, when the apostles were around, and you know, in Jesus' time, at the, at the beginning of, of years that, that we mark them from, in, in this time frame, there were, you know, with Judaism, had kind of fallen away quite a bit from their origins from the Word of God. They had started to already be, be slipping farther and farther away from the truth and, and going more towards the traditions of men. And when you read throughout the Bible, you'll see there's two major sects of Judaism. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We read about them quite a bit throughout the Gospels and throughout Scripture. And even the Apostle Paul, who's writing this, this epistle to the Corinthians, he was a Pharisee. That's the, the religion that he followed. And it's similar to today. You know, we have sects of Christianity. We have Lutherans and, you know, Presbyterians and Pentecostals and all, you know, all these different denominations and all these different groups. And, um, you know, sometimes people will ask, why are there so many different Christian, you know, like, like, why does there have to be so many? Why do you guys all have to argue about this stuff? Why can't you all just get together and just say, well, you all believe in Jesus, right? And that's the real simple understanding of people generally who don't know much about the faith at all. That's kind of what, what gets asked. And I could understand where they're coming from, but the problem is, that there are lots of problems with the way that people worship and what they think is true, which is why we have separated a little bit. But even Paul himself was a Pharisee, as I mentioned earlier, until he got saved. He was not saved as a Pharisee. None of the Pharisees were saved. None of the Sadducees were saved. Now, they might have gotten saved later, but that religion that they believed in, that religion that they taught and that they followed, was not one that can save because it was one of obedience to the law and commandments of men in order for their salvation. It was based on their good works. And just as then the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were false religions. They could not save. There are tons of sects today of Christianity that can't save. And the one thing that separates true believers from the rest of even Christianity are the ones that believe that you have to work for your salvation you have to obey the commandments to some degree, or if you do something bad, you can lose it, or whatever it may be. They're not saved. If you're not putting your faith completely in Christ to save you, you are not saved. If you are trusting in the law or your good works, your good deeds, in the slightest little bit, you are not saved. You have to trust in the finished work of Christ. That's why Christ came. That's why He died on the cross and paid for every single one of our sins. Girls, stop it right now. He paid for every single one of our sins. Not for, not for part of them, all of them. What He did is sufficient to pay the whole bill. It's not He paid the bill, but you still have to keep living good in order to make it to heaven. No. He paid the bill once. It's final. It's done. And Unfortunately, within Christianity today, there are plenty of people out there that believe that know what Christ did. And they won't necessarily say it like this, but what they believe is essentially know what Christ did isn't enough. You still have to obey the law. You still have to follow commandments. And that's why we have division. That's why we do not yoke up together with all of these different religious denominations and stuff because 
They're preaching a false gospel. That's right. And just as in Jesus' day, now you could say they were worshiping the Lord, or at least they thought they were. They would claim they were worshiping Jehovah God. That's what they claimed. I mean, they were, they were, but one sect was a Pharisee, one was a Sadducee, and then you would have true believers that the Bible doesn't ascribe a name to. Same thing today. Now, the Sadducees specifically, I want to focus on them a little bit. What separated them from the Pharisees is that they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe there was a resurrection. They didn't believe there was going to be any resurrection at all. And um, they obviously were not saved. We need, you know, the resurrection is extremely important. This is kind of why I'm going into this. Resurrection is a critical doctrine. We must believe. You have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to even be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, look down where we were. Um, I love this because it just explains the gospel. I mean, you want to give the gospel to somebody? The gospel is the good news of what Jesus did for us. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He said, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, so that's the first point, right? Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve and it goes on and on. That's the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead. We need to believe. That is the gospel. That's the gospel that saves. We need to believe that in order to be saved. The Sadducees, they did not believe that. Now the resurrection is critical and it's just as important as Jesus Christ being the Son of God and living a perfect life and being crucified on the cross. His resurrection is just as important of all of those things. Now I've heard people say that when Jesus said, you know, remember when Jesus was, was on the cross and he was dying and he said, it is finished. Right? True words. But people tend to get in error when they start to describe what does that really mean? Because I've heard some people say, well, everything that Jesus Christ needed to do for our salvation was finished on the cross. And it's not true. It's not true. And the reason why, though, people will say that, see, the resurrection is necessary for our salvation, and that had not happened yet. Okay? So, so not everything was finished in the sense of what Jesus needed to accomplish for our salvation. Now, Jesus Christ's physical, literal you know, job that he had to do while alive on this earth was finished. He had fulfilled all of the prophecies to that point to where now he can give up the ghost, right? And, and physically die and spiritually die that because that was the next step was, was his soul going to hell. Um, but that's usually why. Let me, well, let's jump down in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, no, I'm going to go out of order a little bit. That's fine. I'm going to go out of order a little bit here because the reason why people refer to it as finished of that being everything done for our salvation is because they don't believe that Jesus paid for our sins in hell. Normally when I hear people say that, when they'll make that statement, say, well, everything that Jesus had to do for our salvation was done when he said it is finished on the cross. The reason why they typically will say that is because they don't believe that Jesus Christ paid for our sins in hell. Now, the fact that Jesus Christ paid for our sins in hell only makes sense, first of all. We have plenty of scripture to back that up, but just reason with me for a minute. If the punishment for our sins is hell, it's a punishment of hell, that's what we deserve for our sins. Revelation 21.8, it gives this whole list. It says, in all liars, it caps it off with all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, if that would be our punishment, and Jesus came to pay for our sins, doesn't it make sense that Jesus paid the same punishment that we would have to pay. I mean, it only makes sense. Because people say, well, no, just his shedding of blood was enough. Now look, we are saved through the blood of Christ. 
but that's not the whole picture. I mean, he also had to rise again from the dead. He had to do everything that he did. He had to live the perfect life. He had to, you know, not sin. He had to heal people. He had to do everything. He had to die on the cross. He had to go to hell for three days and three nights. And I'm going to prove that to you from Scripture. Because we could reason. It makes perfect sense when you reason it out. But we have to make sure that our reason also lines up with what the Scripture says. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 4. Actually, no, I take that back. I'll read that for you. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. I'll read for you from Ephesians 4 while you're turning to Acts 2. Ephesians 4, 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So he's saying, you know, he ascended, right? And everyone will say, oh yeah, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He ascended, he went up into heaven. But what is it but that he also descended first is what the Bible is saying. Look, yeah, we know he ascended, but what did he ascend from? He, you know, first we have to understand he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Okay? Now we're going to get a little bit more specific than you say, oh, well, this is the lower part. That doesn't mean he went to hell. Okay, well, read your Bible. What else is there when it talks about the lower parts of the earth? That's right. There is nothing else. But, okay, we'll, we'll prove this further. That's not, I'm not done yet. I'm just getting started. Matthew 22, 32. I know you're in Acts 2. Just stay there. Matthew 22, 32. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And this was in reference to, um, you know, Jesus Christ was saying that, um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're not dead. So when the Bible refers to people as being dead, it's referring to people who were in hell. Okay. People who are in heaven are alive. That's why we have eternal life. When, when you have eternal life, eternal life literally means you are never going to die because you have life that lasts forever. Amen. And people say, well, wait a minute. We're going to die on this earth. Yet physically, your body is going to pass away, but this flesh and bone is not what makes you who you are. You have a soul. You have a spirit. That's genuinely who you are. When someone speaks to you and you interact with people, that is who you are. That is what, you know, when you, when, you, when you converse with people, it's coming from the inside. It's not this flesh and bone. And no, it's not just some, some electrical firings in your brain either. It's you. And when you have eternal life, this shell that, that holds our spirit and soul, that just goes away. But that's not death. That's not us dying. We're just, we're just moving on to something better when this, when this physical shell is gone. If you have eternal life, you never die. But if you don't have eternal life, you do die. And it's, we were going over this yesterday with someone we are giving the gospel. It's, it's basically you call it an eternal death. And people who go to hell are considered dead. And in Revelation, I'll flip there real quick. I wasn't planning on going there, but I'll just, just to point this out. It says in, uh, at, the, at the judgment, in Revelation chapter 20, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So if you have eternal life, is this going to be you standing before God? When he says, I saw the dead standing before God? No. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See, if you, if you are not saved, if you're not born again, you get judged according to your works. We don't get judged according to our works if you're saved because... 
God has given us that free gift of salvation. But if you are trusting, you know, people trust in the law, say, well, I'm, good, I'm a good person, that's why I'm going to heaven, then God is going to judge you, okay? You think you're a good person? Let's lay out everything that you've done in your life and we'll judge you according to your works. That's what happens. And that's a scary thought when you think about how many sins you've committed against the Lord compared to what you've actually done with your life. Even if you were to try to weigh it in the balances, you're going to come up wanting. Okay, but he, he, he says here, you know, the judge according to the works, verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So even hell delivers up the dead, right? People who go to hell, they're dead. They're not alive. They don't have eternal life. They have eternal death. They're considered dead according to the Bible. And Jesus Christ said, God's not the God of the dead, the God of the living. As we talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, hey, they're alive. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, is what Jesus Christ said, because he's alive. And that keep that in mind, because that'll be important. In just uh, well, I'll just I'll hit that point now. In Revelation chapter one, Jesus Christ in, in chapter one, Jesus appears unto John, and John gets this revelation from Jesus Christ about all the end times and stuff. And when Jesus is identifying himself, in verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Jesus Christ said, I was dead. I am he that I'm alive. I was dead. Now, if Jesus Christ didn't go to hell, you can't be considered dead. But he was dead in, in the true sense of the word because he went to hell to pay for our sins. Now, you're in Acts chapter 2 because this is where the, the most clear, one of, one of the most clear verses is regarding this doctrine. Jesus Christ going to hell to pay for our sins. Acts chapter 2, let's, we're going to start reading in verse number 25. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. This is Peter explaining, or he's reading, basically quoting a psalm. Okay? And he, that's why he says in verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him, concerning Christ. And then he quotes this psalm. And then in verse 29, he's going to expound on that psalm. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell." Neither his flesh did see corruption. So if he's speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead, he says the resurrection of Christ. And what was that resurrection? That his soul, that Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. If it wasn't left in hell, it means he was in hell until he resurrected. Neither his flesh did see corruption. And he separates his soul from his flesh. He said his flesh didn't see corruption. It didn't decay. It didn't rot. Also, his soul was not left in hell, but he did go to hell to pay for our sins before rising again for that. And that's what we already saw in Revelation 1.18. But, but why else would Jesus say he has the keys of hell and of death? He has the keys of hell because he went there and he conquered death and hell and rose again from the dead. But he was still able to pay for all of our sins eternally, pay that punishment for us. So no, when Jesus Christ said it is finished, Everything that needed to happen for our salvation was not finished at that moment. Everything, his work he had to do on this earth was done. 
but not everything in the sense that he still had to be in the grave and be in hell for three days and three nights. And he also still had to ascend up and be risen from the dead and the resurrection. We're going to get into that a lot more deeply now about the resurrection. Look at verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm sorry, flip back to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be spending the majority of our time this morning in 1 Corinthians 15. There's so much to cover here where there's no way we can cover it all. 1 Corinthians 15 is extremely deep. There's tons of great verses here that we can learn from. If I have you turn anywhere else for the rest of the morning, keep a finger, keep a bookmark in 1 Corinthians 15 because we will be coming back to this. This is, kind of, this is our main text verse for the mor uh, passage for the morning and we might jump around a little bit but we're always going to be coming back here. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, we read the entire chapter before, before the preaching started but let's look at verse number 12 just to, just to get this idea of the importance of the resurrection. Verse number 12 says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. He's saying, look, if, if, if there, he's talking to, about the Sadducees, look, how say you that there's no resurrection? That if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus Christ is not resurrected from the dead. If there's no resurrection, Jesus didn't resurrect. And he said, if Jesus did not come back from the grave, if he did not ascend, he says, your faith is vain. What are you believing in? You're believing in a dead God, a dead Savior, someone that's not risen, has not conquered death and hell. You're believing in someone who's just dead if there is no resurrection you are yet in your sins he says look you're not saved you're still in your sins if you believe there's no resurrection verse 18 says then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable he's saying if all there is to this is this life, if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing else to look forward to, we're of all men most miserable. Okay, because we live our lives focused on the future, focused on things to come, focused on our resurrection. We do the good works. We do the things necessary because we want to earn rewards. We want to say, hey, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we... We're at, at the resurrection, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we receive our new bodies and Christ is di you know, diving out rewards, He's going to say, well done, now good and faithful servant. That's what we're striving for. That's what our goal is. That's what our aim is. That's how we're living. That's how we're supposed to be trying to live our entire life. It's for that going in. And if there is no resurrection, pff, well, we're of all men most miserable. Why would we want to suffer and endure persecutions from people and go through the hardships and the trials and everything else that you got to go through in this life when you're trying to serve Christ if there's no resurrection. He said, we're of all men most miserable. If, that's, if, if, it's, if this is it, if this is all we got, then, then there's nothing. We're miserable. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 20. The Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. And this is, see, what's, what's neat about Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead is that it's a foreshadowing of our own resurrection. He was the first fruits. He is the first to rise up from the dead and to, to, to receive that glorified body. Okay? And what he's doing is it's showing through Jesus Christ's resurrection, we know now that our resurrection is also going to happen, that, that we are, um, will be in likeness as He is. And well, let's keep reading here. Verse 20, uh, 21. For since by man came death, by man also came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end. 
when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which should put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ foreshadows our own resurrection. And we see here that this is talking about future events. Our, our resurrection hasn't happened yet. There is a lot of Bible prophecy that's tied in even with Jesus Christ's own resurrection. And we see that here in 1 Corinthians 15. He's saying, okay, there are three resurrections that are going to happen total. Christ is the first fruits. That's already happened. He's already resurrected from the dead. It says, Then, afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. So the resurrection, the next resurrection that's going to happen is when Jesus Christ comes back. The second coming of Jesus Christ. It's also known as the rapture. It's commonly known as the rapture, but it's, it's really, in biblical terms, the resurrection. Why is it a resurrection? It's because... Those of us which are alive, we're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. But those that are not, because think about now, it's been you know, 2,000 years since Christ has, has risen from the dead, essentially. I know, give or take some years. But um, there's a lot of Christians that have died in, in, in that time, physically on this earth. They've died. When Jesus Christ comes back, they will be resurrected. Their bodies are going to be resurrected and that is when they're going to receive that new body. That old body that's been buried in the grave and has been in the grave for decades and centuries and you know millennia is going to be raised up again but it's going to be transformed into a new body. You see when we receive the word of God for our salvation, the Bible refers to that word as the seed. God sows the seed in your heart when you receive that seed, when you believe on Christ, when you believe God's word, that's when life happens. See, a seed by itself isn't alive. The seed has to die and then it brings forth that new life. The seed that's sown in your heart is the word of God. When you receive that seed into your heart and put your faith in them, now you have that new life. Now with that new life, is going to come a new body. And, and our old body gets transformed and changed to match the new spiritual life that we have. See, now, right now we have a dichotomy. We have a new spiritual life, but we have an old fleshly body to go with this new spiritual life. And the, the transformation hasn't completed yet. We still have this life inside of us that is going to come to fruition. It's going to come to completion at the second coming of Jesus Christ when we will have the new bodies given unto us. That is called the resurrection of the dead. So that's the second one. Afterward, they that are Christ is coming, then cometh the end. So he says, okay, Jesus Christ's second coming, that's still not the end of everything. There's a lot of other events that are going to happen after Jesus Christ comes back. And Jesus Christ is going to set up his millennial reign, his kingdom for a thousand years. And then the devil is going to be loosed out of hell. And he's going to deceive, you know, go into the four corners of Gog and Magog. He's going to stir up all the unsaved people that are still left, that still haven't put their faith in Christ. Even during that thousand years of Christ's reign on this earth, he's going to stir them up to come to battle against him. And they're all going to be wiped out and destroyed. That's the end. Okay, and then there's going to be a new heaven, new earth, new, you know, new everything. And God's going to just, that's all going to be um, the new Jerusalem. But um, then come at the end, it says, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Because Christ's kingdom is going to be for a thousand years on earth. And then he's going to deliver the kingdom up to God. And that is the moment of that final resurrection. Because then it's like, there is going to be no more death. There is going to be no more anything. It's, it's, it's. Life as we understand it now is going to be completely different. I mean, it's going to be changed significantly when Jesus Christ comes back to reign. But even from that, it will be different because there will be no, no longer, 
you know, this, this um, humans that, that, that are sinning and, and everything else. There's going to be that final judgment where people who are saved and the people who are damned and, that, and that's, that's it. It's over. We're no longer going to continue having the natural births and things like that. Um, so there's, there's ultimately there's three resurrections. Christ is the first fruits. He's just that, that first resurrection of one person. Then they that are Christ is coming and after this cometh the end. Now, um, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 22. And keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be back there. Matthew 22. I know typically on Easter Sunday you're not hearing a whole lot about Bible prophecy. Normally we're just covering the, the resurrection of Christ. But, but the resurrection of Christ, it, it totally points to the future resurrections. I mean, it, this, is, this is tied in inextricably, and, and, and you can see it here in 1 Corinthians 15 that he's talking about future resurrections. And, um, Amen. you know, the, the unsaved Sadducees, they didn't believe in a resurrection. But Jesus told them that they were in error. And it's funny, when you read it, he didn't say it quite like this, but he's basically asking them if they've even read the Bible. And there's a lot of people these days where they're in error regarding the second resurrection because they think it's going to happen before we go through any type of trials and persecutions or tribulation. And they think we're just going to be beamed out of here. But I would say, kind of like Jesus said, haven't you read your Bible? Because the Bible talks a lot about us being going, you know, the Antichrist is going to come and there's going to be people martyred and slain for Jesus' namesake and there's going to be tribulations such as the world has not seen. And it's going to come on believers. But let's look at Matthew 22. We're going to see how Jesus' interaction with the Sadducees. Matthew 22, look at verse 23. The Bible says, The same day came to him the Sadducees which say that there is no resurrection. You say, How do you know that, that the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection? Because it says so right here. <laughs> That's right. I don't study like all these other history books to find out what the Sadducees believed. I could just get it straight from the Bible. He says, Then came to him, the same, the, the, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third all, and unto the seventh, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Now, <laughs> it's funny when, when people are so just... They already accept this false doctrine, no, no resurrection. They come up with these weird, silly examples saying, okay, well, Mr. I believe in a resurrection. So what happens then? What happens when, you know, there's these seven brothers and they all have the same woman to wife because they're following the law of Moses. They're doing what they're supposed to do, but they never have a child. So whose wife is she then? Right, huh, huh? You're like, yeah, see, yeah. Who, whose wife is she, huh, Jesus? You think there's this resurrection. Well, whose wife is she going to be? Because you can't be all of their wives. But they're focused on the wrong thing completely. Just, they, they go on these rabbit trails. Their, their whole premise is just wrong. So they go off on these, these weird tangents. Jesus answers them, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err. You're wrong. You're in error. You do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So he's saying, look, you're in error. You don't know the Bible. You don't know the scriptures. He's saying, haven't you read this? Haven't you read this for yourself? It's plain in the scripture. This is what he's saying to him. He's like, God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said this to people after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long gone from this earth. They, I mean, he was still referring to himself as their God. And that's what he's trying to tell us. Hey, you're like, don't you see this? 
Don't you read it? If there's no resurrection of the dead, if these people have no life, if this is all we have, why is he going to continue to reference he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They're already long gone. He said, of course there's a resurrection. Of course there's eternal life. Now we know that there is a resurrection to come because of the resurrection of Christ. He's the one who, who really finalized and, and when, the, when the, the disciples saw that, it just, it just confirms. Right? You could read the scripture you could, and you can believe it, but when Jesus Christ came, he affirmed it. He confirmed the word with his own resurrection, which gives us that hope for the future. We can hope and, and know that, hey, Jesus Christ has already risen from the dead. We know this is going to happen. I mean, he proved it to us. It's not just something that we can read and, you know, and, and still believe because it's God's word. But the fact that Jesus Christ did it, I mean, that should just be like, no doubt. No doubt. He did it. It happened. It's going to happen for us too. Now, the area where people are mistaken today is when, um, is when that will take place. And I think a similar response is in order. So I said, you know, people who think that Jesus can come at any time. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. If you are in Matthew, just move forward a bit. <clears throat> to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. It's kind of in the middle of the New Testament. Because a lot of people today think that Jesus can just come at any time. And that, and that we, just, we have no idea when, but he can come at any time. But the Bible gives us so many, so many examples, so many illustrations of, of, of things that have to happen first. Like in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, look, the man of sin needs to be revealed first. He's going to stand in the temple showing himself that he is God. He's going to be speaking blasphemies against God. Like this has to happen before the, the resurrection before the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's what, and I'll just read, you know, we're, you flip over to 2 Thessalonians, I mean, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, they're real close to each other. 2 Thessalonians 2, let's see that real quick. He says um, in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Well, you know what? Let's start reading in verse 2 because it says, in verse 3 we see, for that day shall not come. Well, what day? What day shall not come? Verse, verse 2 explains it. He says, that ye be not soon, or let's start with verse 1. Let's just start with the whole chapter. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together on him. So what's the context starting in verse number 1 of chapter 2? The, co the, the coming of Jesus Christ. Our gathering together unto him. This is the rapture. This is, this is Jesus Christ coming to us. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying don't let anybody trouble you or concern you as that that day of Christ is at hand, like it could happen at any time. He said, don't let people trouble you that way, because it's not. It's not just, Christ can come back right now. We don't know. He says, that's not the way it is. He says, because, verse 3, let no man deceive you. Don't let anyone trick you by any means, for that day shall not come except. So that day's not going to come unless, except, until these things happen, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, is there anybody today that has exalted themselves above all that is called God and is literally sitting in the temple of God, which, by the way, doesn't exist again yet, showing himself that he is God? 
That is not happening yet today. So until this happens, Christ, the day of Christ has not come and it will not come until this happens first. We're given clear warnings on this. We know we need to look for these things to happen. Then we know that the time is at hand. Then we know that the day of Christ is near. Then we know it's going to be time for Jesus Christ to come back and to set up his kingdom. But until this happens, don't let anyone trick you. Don't let anyone deceive you as that the day of Christ is at hand because it's not. It simply isn't. You don't need to fall for anything like the, the herald campings and saying, oh, the world's going to end. Was, you know, and I looked in the Bible and I got this date and it's you know, May 15th and, it's, you know, and, and you, know, you need to prepare now and sell all that you have and give it to me and we'll, you know, we'll do all this work for Christ. No. Don't let people trick you because that's not going to happen until these things happen first. God's given us the signs. God's given us the, the order of events of what will happen. We can trust God's word to be true. But um, flip, I just wanted to point that out to you. Flip over to 1 Thessalonians 4, just about a page back in your Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to start reading in verse 13. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant. God, he has, look, the Apostle Paul, he doesn't want you to be ignorant. He doesn't want you to, to not know, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So people who are asleep, he's referring to people who have died physically. People have died already in the past. I don't want you to, to be ignorant about them. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Just as tremendous and amazing and, and um, cause for rejoicing is Jesus Christ's ascension and resurrection from the dead, hey, we have that same comfort and looking forward to that second resurrection. You've lost loved ones in your life, people who are no longer with you, but they were saved. They were believers in Christ. The Bible is talking about them being asleep right now. Now, that's their bodies, okay? Their spirit, their soul is alive in heaven with Jesus Christ. But their, their bodies are asleep. But we're all going to be caught up together when Jesus Christ comes back. So if, you're, if we happen to be the ones that are lucky enough to be alive and remain at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, hey, take comfort. Those, those loved ones, you're going to see them again. Just as sure as Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, there's going to be another resurrection. They're going to be resurrected as well. And we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's good news. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. It's the last play. Well, I'm not going to have you jump around anywhere else this morning. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll wrap it up. First Corinthians 15, we're going to start reading here in verse number 46. And this is kind of a lot more scripture backing up what I was uh, preaching a little bit earlier about, you know, receiving the seed into your heart and that, that, that seed is sown, a natural seed, or is it sown a spiritual seed? Um, and our body will, will also um, be changed as well. And we're going to read a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse number 46. The Bible reads, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, 
such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So he's saying, like, right now, we're of the earth. We're, we're descended literally from Adam, right? He was physical, fleshly man. We are physical, fleshly people. And we have that image of, of the earthy, of him that was created from the earth. But, he says, we shall also bear the image of of the heavenly because of the new spirit that's inside of us when our bodies are changed. Look at verse number 50. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So, as we obviously can see, you know, we don't go to heaven in these bodies that we have here. It's not like when you die, your whole body, flesh and blood and everything gets transported up to heaven. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And our new bodies, by the way, are not going to be flesh and blood. In this life, for our bodies, the Bible says that the blood is the life thereof. That's why the, the Jews weren't allowed to, to drink the blood. Like, you're not supposed to, to drink, and we're, we shouldn't even today be drinking blood. Because the Bible says that the blood is the life thereof. So it's the, it's the li yeah, not that anyone would really want to, but you know, the, the blood is, is the life thereof. There are some weirdos out there. I mean, there's people who think that there's these magical powers, and it's these Satan worshippers, and these people who believe in like the vampires, and they want to get these evil powers and stuff because... It's just completely of Satan because it's completely against what God said. God said not to do it. Satan says, yeah, do it. Satan will try to trick you and say, oh, yeah, you're get all these powers if you do this. And God's just trying to keep that from you because God's a mean God and he doesn't want you to have these powers. And that's why they get deceived on, on that train of thought. But, you know, any normal person in the right mind is going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to drink blood because that's just weird. But, um, <laughs> you know, the Bible says that the blood is the life through us. But, but the life that we have See, the, the blood is the life for our flesh, but the life that we have for our spirit is Jesus Christ. He is our life. We don't need this blood anymore, and the blood represents the, the physical of um, our blood in our, in our flesh is, is our physical life, which cannot, is our sinful flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why we need a new spiritual body. So he says in verse um, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So the Obviously, our current physical bodies have aches and pains and it grows old and, 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 and dies. But the new body that we're going to have is going to have none of those ailments, none of those problems. It's going to, th this corruptible body, it's, it's able to come to corruption, it's going to put on incorruptible. It's going to be perfected. It's going to be amazing. I mean, it's just going to be great. We're going to have these bodies that, that will never grow old and die and it will be an immortal body. Our mortal flesh right now is going to be changed in a moment. It's just going to be like done. Just immediately. You're going to, if, if we happen to be alive, boom. Twinkling of an eye. Can't even count how fast that is. Your body is just going to be changed. Now, my last point for this morning, we're almost done, is... What I want to walk away with, hopefully you learned something new. If you didn't, that's fine. It's always good to go over this stuff. But when we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we could take this time to reflect, but also use this as a motivation to walk in newness of life. The life that Jesus brought through His resurrection. Think about what He did for us and His resurrection and the joy and the happiness that we get from Him raising from the dead. Use that to, to help stir up your own soul and to motivate you and, and to, to make you to, to do more things for Christ and to just, just be uplifting for you, to, to not have confidence in our own flesh, but have the confidence in a living Savior, a Savior that lives, a Savior that has conquered death and hell. He's risen again from the dead. That is our Savior. That's who we serve. We're excited and motivated and want to serve Him and want to tell the whole world about what He's done for us. This is what I want you to walk away with this morning 
for the more than anything else is this 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 desire to serve the living Savior and to and to do what He has for us to do. Let's read in verse number thirty one of First Corinthians fifteen. We're going to go back a little bit to to verse number thirty one. The Bible reads, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We kind of went over that similar concept earlier. It says, verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. <coughs> Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, he's throwing this in there. You know, about just when he's going over Christ's resurrection, and he says, Look, don't be deceived. Evil communications, just speaking things you shouldn't be speaking, um, you know, saying things you ought not to be talking about corrupt good manners. The, the way that you talk is going to influence the way that you act. He's saying, be careful that you don't even just get involved in conversations you shouldn't be talking about because it's going to lead to you acting in ways that you shouldn't be acting. Don't think that you can separate the two and that, oh, I can talk about dirty things and it's not going to affect the way that I act because it will. It corrupts good manners. And he says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Okay? He's saying, you give up those sins. Get them out of your life. And then he says, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why, why would it be a shame for them because some don't have the knowledge of God? Because it means that they're not giving them the knowledge of God. You say, it's a shame. It's a shame that you have people that don't even have the knowledge of God in your area. Why is that? Because you're not sharing the knowledge of God with them. That is our duty. That is our responsibility. It's a shame if you're a Christian, if you can rejoice in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, today, and you're not sharing that with anybody. It's a shame. There's no reason not to do it. We need to get that sin out of our life of not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain it made chance of wheat, excuse me, or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us that victory over death, over sin, over hell, because of what Jesus Christ did, because Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. So verse 58, last verse, Therefore, because God has given us this great victory through Jesus Christ, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Don't let anyone shake your faith. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Continue to do the work for God because the work that you do is not in vain. It's not meaningless. It's not for nothing. There is a resurrection. Don't let people tell you that, oh, all we have is this life, and once this life is over, that's it. We just sleep in the ground, and it's just your existence ceases to be. That's not true. We need to stay steadfast, unmovable, continuing, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we know our labor is not in vain. The work that we're doing for God, it's not in vain. It will produce a result. God will bless it. God will use it. There is more to this life than what we can see with our eyes and feel with our hands and smell with our nose and taste with our mouth. There's more to this life than that. There is a resurrection to come. Unfortunately, there's a resurrection for some that's going to be to damnation. It's not for us, but there are many that are going to be resurrected to damnation. We need to go out and preach the good news of Jesus Christ and be steadfast and unmovable and be able to say, look, this is not in vain. We have a living Savior. We have a Savior that can give you life. It's not for nothing. Even if you get beaten down sometimes and you think, well, nobody wants to listen to me. Look, what you're doing is not for nothing. You're bringing life to people. It's up to them to choose, but you never know, even still, even if you go through a rough patch and nobody wants to listen to you, you don't know what impact you may have even further down the road for that one person that you may never know about until the resurrection happens. And you're like, wow, you didn't want to have anything to do with what I was saying. But God works in people's lives and in their hearts. You don't know. So don't think that what you're saying isn't important because it is. If you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's the most important thing you could ever talk to anybody about. Let's, let's honor our Savior that died, went to hell, paid for every single individual sin that you could ever think of that you've ever done in your life, and rose again from the dead. Let's honor Him by bringing that life to others. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much that You are a risen Savior, that You are a living God, dear God. We, we thank You for giving us the free gift of life that You don't make us earn it or work for it because we fall short. Lord, we, we love You. And the only reason we love you is because you first loved us, as, as your word says. But God, we thank you so much for the tremendous gift. Help stir up our spirits this morning as, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Help stir us up to have a love for the lost that um, we can try to, to save people from, from experiencing the resurrection of the dead of the, uh, unto damnation, that we can help point them to the life that is through your Son and only through your Son, dear God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.